The central part of the webinar today is um, a case presentation. It's going to be a mixture of slides and a live in the box. We're going to have some active discussion around this, uh, this case that illustrates uh, the problem with dealing with eccentric calcium and I suppose the potential role that Shockwave has in helping us with that. So this is an 82-year-old man who presented with an acute non-ST elevation MI. He's found on echo to have moderate LV dysfunction and he had lots of important comorbidity. He's got some renal dysfunction with a baseline EGFR of 48 and bad peripheral vascular disease, including bilateral iliac stenosis and bilateral subclavian artery stenosis. The previous history of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation for which he'd been treated with pulmonary vein isolation and had COPD and celiac disease. So I'll show you the baseline angiograms. So what you see on the left here is a PA caudal view. And we can see that he has some eccentric calcific disease involving the left main bifurcation and particularly severely in the ostium of the LED. You can see that the, the ostium of the circumflex is also abnormal. There's a segment then in the proximal circumflex where it looks quite healthy. And then there's another calcific segment of disease in the mid circumflex. Very importantly, there's a collateral, an epicardial collateral that comes off the mid circumflex and supplies the right coronary artery, which you'll see as we go through the films, is a CTO. The image on the right is an areocaudal, which just illustrates the same points and shows the severity of the lesion involving the ostium of the LED. The picture on the, the left here is the areocranial view. You can see there's a further lesion in the proximal LED, which angiographically doesn't look particularly severe, but we'd be keen obviously to go on and assess that further. Again, you can see some collateralization from the circumflex over to the right coronary. And you can see in the image on the right that we've got a calcified chronic total occlusion of the right coronary artery. So in terms of the indication for this case, this is an elder, elderly gentleman with a non-ST elevation MI, he had preceding crescendo angina, and he's got multiple comorbidities. I wondered what the panel thought about how they, they would approach this case and maybe give me some of their thoughts. Thank you, Margaret. Let me start uh, asking a few questions. Thanks, Carlo. It's a um, three-vessel disease. There are severe calcification, is not the ideal age, and the patient is uh, admitted with an acute coronary syndrome. In theory, you have uh, more uh, surgical than uh, angioplasty indication. Having said that, uh, First, uh, you have to know the patient and uh, for what I understand, the multiple comorbidities have to be um, carefully considered. Uh, personally, I would say I, I will probably um, go after the right coronary artery first. There is a very severe occlusive lesion, but you are not uh, you're completely uh, ruling out the possibilities of having a relatively straightforward crossing of the wires under control lateral injection. At that point, treatment of the left main will become extremely safe. You will have reverse collateral for the large um, left circumflex. I, I think that's, that will be my approach. Yeah, it's always an interesting discussion, that Carlo, isn't it? About whether in this situation you deal with the the complex left-sided disease or you go after the CTO. And I always have a dilemma with myself about what the the, the best approach is in that situation. Holger, have you any um, any opinion about how you would approach this? Well, I'm com I'm completely supporting the hypothesis of uh, Carlo, and I, I think this is uh, we have to discuss, of course, with the surgeons how to approach um, these kind of uh, non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. However, if there are these uh, multiple comorbidities of this elderly gentleman, of course, um, this is a very straightforward approach. Um, however, we have to tackle this uh, very calcified lesion in the osteal LED, um, which um, seems to me not that easy um, to tackle. And um, for that reason, to have more information about the lesion and um, to have more insights into the morphology of the lesion, I would love to see, of course, the intravascular imaging in this case, um, which might be um, uh, 
facilitate the strategy building, especially in this kind of mission. Okay, so um, really interesting contribution. So I did exactly the opposite of what you both suggested. And uh, we decided that we would start with the left system. He was reviewed by the cardiac surgeons who felt that he was very high risk for surgery in the context of his calcific vascular disease and his left ventricular dysfunction. Um, and he was referred back to us for a complex PCI. So we had this debate that we just discussed and we decided that we would go after the left system disease and try and be very careful to protect the collateral to the right coronary artery. Um, and um, we decided that our strategy would be to deal with the calcium and the left main bifurcation, also assess that proximal LED um, to see if anything needed done with that and obviously deal with that disease in the proximal to mid circumflex. Um, we used, our plan was to use seven frame radial access with a seven frame GBU 3.5 guide and to start with two wires and then I was both the LED back into left main and the circumflex back into left main. We're anticipating needing calcium modification our plan would then be after modification to re ivus and confirm that we felt we had treated the calcium appropriately. And then our plan was to um, use collot stenting for the left main bifurcation because the caliber of the LED in the circumflex looked to be similar. Our plan then would be to do ivus at the end to make sure our expansion was good, hopefully, to see that we didn't have significant eccentricity. So what I'm going to do is go on and show you some clips from the case. This case was done unbelievably now 12 months ago um, as, a, as a live case. And um, I'm going to show a series of uh, short clips uh, and we'll stop in between and discuss how we feel the case is progressing. So we're going to um, join the case when we've wired both limbs and we've IVIS both limbs and we're going to run through the IVIS pullback starting with the LED back into left main and then the circumflex. The audience in uh, this case is uh, in the USA, um, and this was uh, at a time where IVL and shockwave was very new to the audience, and you'll be able to pick that up from some of the discussion. Okay, so this is the, we'll show you the LED back into left me in the first, Roxana. So this is the healthy segment of the LED down at the mid vessel. Um, you'll see us come up through that. So it's pretty much 4 0 artery down there. There's some modest plaque just here on the, the left hand side as you see it and then we're going to start entering some of the calcific disease. So you'll see here there's a 90 degree arc on the left and now it becomes almost circumferential in this spot here. The slight kind of disconnection at the bottom about 6 p.m. It's kind of milder here as we come through that lesion. Just a mild localized kind of plaque, uh, calcific plaque down there at five o'clock. And if we follow up through the vessel you'll see the calcium starts to return here on the right hand side, just over 90 degrees here, there's a diagonal coming in at seven, eight o'clock. And again, heavy calcium there just, just in front of the diagonal, about 180 degrees. And then as we come up through the proximal LED towards that kind of uh, severe lesion in the osteum, we we'll start to see the lumen come down in size. And we think this is a kind of mixed morphology here. The stenosis is tight. There's some protrusion almost in a nodular manner, but actually when you come back in towards the distal left main, the calcium is quite extensive, comes around here in a 180 arc from the LED pullback, and you'll see when we show you the circumflex, it's actually much more circumferential from that, from the two different perspectives. So our assessment of this is we've got a nice landing zone distally, and we've got two areas of quite severe calcification, one in the, the LED and then one in kind of proximal to mid LED beyond that diagonal and the second at the osteum uh, into the left main. So we'll go ahead and show you the circumflex Ivis and then we can talk about what you think. So this is a circumflex now. So um, there's a lesion in the mid circumflex um, that looks kind of moderate almost angiographically but you'll see it's very heavily calcified. This is us coming towards it now. Again, a big vessel, probably 335 down there. So very heavy calcification here. Looks kind of irregular with little reverberation in some spots, suggesting it's quite thick. 
And then you'll see there's kind of a more milder calcific plaque in a 90 to 180 degrees all the way up through this segment to the mid to proximal circumflex. You can see that in the longitudinal view as well. There's just one big line of calcium right along that side of the vessel. That's a kind of posterior branch that comes off to supply the collateral to the right coronary artery, which thankfully in that segment, the vessel's not severely diseased. So we're a bit more comfortable about treating across that segment. And then as you can see here, the calcium becomes much more extensive and almost circumferential. So that's, that's coming up through the proximal vessel now. And that continues towards the osteum. And we can see that the proximal circumflex again is quite large, probably a photo up there. You see here we've got this kind of irregular, non-smooth calcium down from three to six o'clock that then becomes smoother towards the osteum. And this is us approaching the bifurcation now. So there's the LED coming out at the top. You can see there's calcium on both sides of the bifurcation. It's probably one, it's certainly over 180 degrees. And then we have this huge left main, over five millimeters. Now there's also a calcific plaque you can see here in the roof of the left main that goes all the way towards the osteum. Okay, so any thoughts from um, Carla and Holger? Well, just to please start me, with... Please, no, hold, just... No, um, I think it's a very heavy calcified lesion and uh, this is very, very, very um, um, difficult to uh, find the right strategy on these kind of lesions. So the question I have is, um, do we think that the thickness of the calcium is uh, at least more than five millimeters now from the IVOS pictures, or what do you think? What do you think, Carolyn? Um, well, thickness, of course, is difficult to judge. However, if you look at that as little like orifice in the osteal LED, I will be very surprised whether this is a relatively thin calcium, I think it's uh, almost uh, half of the vessel is probably uh, calcific and it's a very large uh, 3, 5, 4 millimeter vessel. So there are definitely indications in terms of thickness. However, if you consider the classical score, uh, Fugino for instance, probably won't qualify that particular spot. However, is a patient that has also other more concentric stenosis. So I would say, uh, since you have to do uh, what is a more, lo a more accepted indication for shockwave, I would go for shockwave also at the ostium or the LAD. Um, consider that uh, uh, we are dealing with uh, uh, extremely uh, important vessels and you want to optimize uh, your final outcome. Yeah. Yes, our feeling was that the, we were surprised by that area in the proximal LED, which angiographically didn't look so bad, but actually in the IVUS looked very calcified and significant. We we're also surprised by how severe the lesion in the mid circumflex was on the IVUS 2. Um, so at that point, we decided that the most efficient way to deal with this, and we thought the safest way, especially with the blocked right and the LV, was, was to keep both wires and try and use calcium modification um, with a balloon-based technology. We felt the calcium was severe enough, particularly in those two spots and in the ostium of the LED and I suppose in the ostium of the circumflex, that shockwave would be uh, the most appropriate choice and the most efficient choice in this case. Um, so our feeling was that we would go on and most likely need to use two balloons because there was probably going to be four areas that we would need to treat. Um, and shockwave uh, all those all those areas, um, and then repeat our IVUS to make sure we had adequately treated it, um, so that we could we would be guaranteed to get a nice left main two cent um, bifurcation result. Margaret, there's a question regarding um, the uh, fact that you have to inflate your balloon and in right of the right of in the uh, left main, which might yeah. uh, affect the. Uh, 
patients uh, we function in during this procedure? Do you have some thoughts about uh, mechanical support in these patients? Yeah, it's an interesting question that came up during the live case. So we work in a, a service and a system where um, we're fairly conservative about that, largely for fiscal reasons. Um, so normally what we would do in this situation is we would sometimes obtain access to the femorals with a small sheath and if necessary, occasionally if we're really concerned, we'll even put a balloon pump in, even despite the lack of obviously evidence base to surround that. And then our escalation actually is usually to ECMO rather than Impella. Again, for fiscal reasons, we're a transplant centre and we have ready access to ECMO. The concern in this man was though that his vascular disease was pretty bad uh, in his legs and also his subclavians. So after a discussion, we decided that we were going to do it with the leg prepped, but with no femoral access unless we absolutely needed it. Another reason I felt that using IVL would be good because Obviously, we all know that um, when you perform arthritis in these types of uh, lesions, particularly that osteo LED, there is a reasonable chance we're going to make them ischemic, maybe with some uh, distal uh, embolization of plaque. And uh, it's, I think, certainly from the, the, the cases I've done so far in this type of scenario with some LV dysfunction and left main bifurcation, I've been very uh, very encouraged by the lack of hemodynamic or ischemic issues I've had with the with the shockwave balloon. I normally um, use a balloon the same in the left main as everywhere else, so I just deliver my 10 therapies as usual. I keep the balloon inside you between the delivery of therapy, therapy in fives, you know, to try and reduce the time you have the balloon up, including the left main, which is quite interesting. And that's something I suppose if I was worried about the hemodynamics, I might try in the future. But um, so far, I haven't had a big problem. I haven't had any problems with them um, having the balloon up repeatedly in the left main in these cases. Have either two of you had any, any bad experience with that or concern about that? No, Margaret, I, you were very brave uh, not to use uh, an impeller like I'm sure all your American colleagues uh, were trying to force you to do <laughs> during the life uh, case. But they also practice somehow a defensive medicine. Let, let's, let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. Uh, there they are some... Um, uh, different uh, scenario. Fortunately, we don't uh, face a similar situation yet in Europe. <laughs> However, uh, um, the, another point that you, uh, I think, uh, um, should point out is that uh, with shockwave, you don't have the noreflow flow that you see, for instance, in the left circumflex over a long segment of treatment. You have protection with two wires. It's true, with alteration, rarely you lose a branch. However, that's potentially an issue. Uh, high pressure balloon dilatation, if you were not going to do a rotablator like for the LED, I'm not so sure what you achieve with the rotablation in a, such an eccentric lesion in mm -hmm. such a large vessel. vessel uh, you may get end up into somehow disaster if you if you don't have protection with the wire. On the contrary, shockwave is a safe technique. You go at low pressure. You don't get a large dissection. That's what we have seen over and over in the disrupt registry. Uh, you can split your number of inflations, uh, not necessarily doing all 10 uh, one after the other. Um, I think all eight uh, one after the other. I think that that's, uh, gives you enough uh, uh, security for, for uh, achieving a good result without the protection. Okay, well, I'll go on and show you the next clip. So the next clip is us delivering um, therapy. So we decided to start with the LED back into left main. Um, so I'll show you how that goes. I think the panel had spent excellent in an excellent manner the, the challenges of this calcification, the distribution, the nature of it, and also the fact that probably as the iris cap passed so easily and it is quite eccentric, rotational arthritis might not offer the calcium modulation that you want. So we're going to do the plan with us is that we're going to use intravascular lithotripsy. And on both vessels, we have planned two stent uh, techniques. So we're going to start with the LED and we're going to start with the distal segment first. And we're going to deliver 10 therapies, 10 to 20 therapies distally, 
10 therapies in the midsection of the next calcified and then concentrate the remaining therapies from the IVL balloon um, on the very proximal osteo segment. So we're taking a 3.5 millimeter lithotripsy balloon to do that. Um, and once we plant the lithotripsy both limbs, then we plan the bifurcation stepping technique. And for this one, we're going to use some dedicated new, newly available large vessel stents, and that's going to be the Boston Site Traffic Megatron stents, which are specifically designed for left main work, which allow post all the way up to six, which is going to be very relevant in a left main of this size. So we're just going to start now and deliver our first few therapies in the mid section of the LED, just prior to where this is going to end. So what we do is we take the balloon up to four atmospheres to allow so your idea is that you're basically yeah, so shock therapy, you're doing shock therapy for almost the entire vessel, not just to the lesion at hand. Uh, you really want to get great so expansion across the entire to, vessel. So we're going to try and be very focal. So there are three areas of particular calcification in the, the LED IVIS. So we're going to focally um, shockwave all those three segments. So there's a little bit distally, which we're just doing, just to see the balloon went up very nicely. And then we're going to, there's another small area of calcification there, but again, so we take up four atmospheres when we deliver 10 therapies. And you'll see, uh, Roxana, I've got the device here in my hands. There's a green light on, tells me I'm ready to go. And I just press the button and it will deliver 10 shocks to that area. Very simple. We'll show you the console in a little second. So that's 10 therapies, yeah. it cuts out. And then so so tell us for how long you leave the balloon, balloon up and what what um, what kind of uh, uh, litho, uh, lithoplasty uh, rate are you using? And how do you decide? Margaret. Okay, so we'll, we'll show you this time. So we're gonna go up to four atmospheres here. And then what we do is every time you deliver therapy, you deliver 10 shocks. You press this button and it'll give you 10 shocks and then it cuts out and you have 80 therapies from each balloon. And then once your 80 is up, that's it, the balloon's done. And if you need more, you need another balloon. So that's us giving them um, 30 now in two different locations. And then I'm going to come back and concentrate on that particularly severe part and the obstacle LED LED distal left main and give more kind of a, a bigger proportion of the therapy to where we see the more severe calcium. And now, as we were saying earlier on in the discussion, obviously with the complexity of this case and the complexity of the, the patient's anatomy and the T2 of the right, yeah, thanks. Um, it's important to do a very efficient and um, you know, safe procedure here. And that's one of the beauties of this technology, that it's, if it's effective, it's, um, you don't have the, I suppose, the concerns you sometimes have when you're doing rota in this situation where you often can get some distal slow flow and, and, and when there's a heavy calcium burden and uh, when you have to lose the wire in your side branch. So the beauty of this is we can keep our wire in the circ and um, hopefully, quite simply, deal with what's a very complex kind of diffuse calcific double vessel left main bifurcation. So you'll see here the balloon's expanding quite nicely. So this is a 3.5 shockwave balloon we've got because we're sizing it to the more distal lesion one-to-one. -one. Okay, yeah, so, so I that's see that's that you're, uh, you, you keep the balloon dilated for not very long and uh, apply the, uh, yeah. the, 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 uh, the shock, uh, the shock waves in a, in a, in a fast fashion. And I yeah. saw you started distal to proximal. Is that how you usually uh, yeah. do this work or do you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we usually go distal to proximal as long as you can get the balloon down that you occasionally maybe you have to treat the more proximal lesion then to to deliver the balloon. So the, the technique is you inflate the balloon to four atmospheres just to oppose the balloon to the vessel wall. You then deliver your shocks. And then just when you finish delivering the shocks, you do you increase the pressure to six. That's just the get. Okay, so you can um, you can hear the I need the translator. <laughs> so Roxana was having some difficulty understanding my Scottish accent, I think, at points during the during the case. I think the panel had straight. So any any further comments so far guys? No? Master is executed. Thank you. Excellent. So I'll go on and 
I have a question. So how are you sure that your um, balloon is expanded um, sufficiently um, in this kind of lesion? So do we take uh, some or two projection of these, the, the balloon um, inflation or how do you uh, how are you sure that your balloon is sufficiently um, inflated? I think that's a great comment, Holger, actually, and I think it, that's a really um, nice tip for people that when the balloon's up to spin around to a contralateral view to make sure you're not being fooled with the uh, eccentric expansion. Um, and that's something I've started more recently to do uh, because I've been caught out by that, um, not with shockwave, but with other balloons uh, in similar cir circumstances. Is that something you do routinely? Well, we have learned it from the um, uh, biosolvable scaffold um, redilation item that we have to look, of course, to the um, expansion of our balloons uh, just before we implant a biosolvable scaffold. And um, this, um, yeah, we have adopted a little bit um, from these times uh, to the little tripsy, just to be um, very sure that the uh, that we have um, reached an, a, a calcium cracking. Um, which um, allows our stents to expand properly. And I suppose that's probably a particularly helpful tip if you're not going to use intravascular imaging, which obviously we know a lot of people maybe either don't have access to or don't routinely use. Um, so I use uh, imaging in all these cases, so I suppose I'm reassured by being able to assess my follow-on imaging, but I think you're right. If you're, if you're not going to do that, you should definitely check in multiple views. I'll go on and show you the treatment in the circumflex. Far away, but yeah. Uh, See, shock. No, yeah. not an implant. Just no, not at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's why shocking. they feel comfortable without LV support here. With yeah, their... that's amazing. Yeah. But those yeah. are short, very short. Exactly. <laughs> Any comments from yeah, anyone so on the panel? Anyone else these... has used the shockwave on the panel? Okay, we'll okay. change shockwave over. Rasha? So I have to say, I mean, I was thinking hopefully you were going to use shockwave because when you know that you're going to have to have a wire in the side branch, it definitely feels so much nicer to use the shockwave as opposed to rotiblating across a very big circumflex in the absence of a right coronary artery. So I think it definitely makes the technique a bit more controlled and safer. Yeah, really. So now you plan to go down the circ with the same so balloon or is so it a different size? With a, with a second balloon? Yeah, so it's a different one. This is a 3 we we've got for the cert because distally the vessel's kind of 3 So tell us size. how you size the balloon. Um, do you undersize it? How do you size the balloon for... Uh, no, we... One to one, Roxana. I'm just one. trying to understand. How do you size the balloon uh, as you choose to, uh, when you go to the shockwave? Is it one to one or is it, uh, or do you undersize? One to one. One to one, Here, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's one to one we size it. Um, so now we're just taking the balloon down in the circumflex. So it is it's a nice technique, and as you mentioned, that allows preservation of the wire on both of the, the major epicardial vessels when we're working. And as you see, delivered really nicely through both uh, calcific vessels. Yeah. And, and it's interesting how easy you were able to deliver the balloon despite this calcific, so it's a slick, yeah. it's a slick balloon. That's interesting. Yeah, I think that the fact you yeah. can deliver an IVIS tells you a lot, though. Right, it's exactly. Hector? Yeah, I'm curious yeah, yeah. Um, to hear from the operators. Uh, they are ballooning very distal into the LED, but also now in the circumflex. So we, what we like to prevent here is geographical bees. And so are you thinking of stenting the whole region? Because now you are very uh, far into the circuit. That would need to be covered by a metallic stent at some point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to stent all the way down both vessels. So the reason for that is that um, the, there's no way we're going to be able to treat that left main LED without compromising the ostium of the cirque looking at the ibis. And if you look at the cirque, the plaque extends all the way down to where we're ballooning just now. So we want to go healthy to healthy. Um, so if we're going to have to deal with the, prop, the ostium of the cirque, we're, we're going to have to deal with that whole thing of proximal to mid cirque to get the best long-term outcome for this patient. And all so I thought that was quite, they were, they were quite um, persistent about this, about us stenting um, you know, the LED and the circuit as well as the bifurcation, which kind of puzzled me because 
The ibis showed the cirque was extensively diseased all the way to the ostium. So I don't know whether they had just kind of missed that on the ibis, but we had, we had quite a lot of pushback from them about that. Uh, the other two, you get any comments about that strategy? Well, I'm afraid that that uh, is so ingrained in people's mind uh, that uh, you should try to be uh, as much as possible provisional that sometimes you uh, overdo and, and uh, you make your life much more miserable by using uh, uh, techniques of bifurcational stenting that are much less effective than the two stent techniques that uh, start with already a stent in the side branch, like in your case, you plan a culotte. I would have personally done a decay crash, but I think the, the aim is the same. You don't do a T stenting, for instance, in a case like this. It makes no sense. It's not the right angle. Uh, um, you will have some protrusion. You will have possibly some missed uh, osteal uh, lesion if you don't do it uh, um, uh, right. That makes no sense, uh, but still people, even if the evidence is all saying that uh, for similar lesions, you have at least similar outcome, if not better, some more recent uh, also randomized trials, people still uh, 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 throw uh, this uh, magical world provisional and stick to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, well I, I just, just a comment regarding the excess of the side branch, which is, I think, uh, the benefit from the DK crush uh, strategy in this uh, kind of lesion. So um, my personal choice would be in DK crush because I'd never lose my side branch, even if you would define the LAD as a side branch or, or the CERG, um, and um, with the culottes as well as with the provisional um, kind of uh, strength strategies. Of course, this is always uh, the danger in this kind of lesion. Okay, thanks for those comments. I'm just going to, there's a follow on short clip here, I think, just as we finish the. Um, I mean, the and then some of us might say, well, what about the cutting balloon in a case like yeah. this if you don't want to go through, um, you know, uh, th that kind of a thing? I mean, it seems like. We, we, we never had a head-to-head -head of any of these uh, devices together. Uh, Pascal, what are your thoughts? How would you approach uh, this as they're working to, to deliver the shocks? Uh, to be honest, I have also concern towards the further on therapy, uh, the anticoagulation therapy in this patient. Uh, with all these stents, this patient has an atrial fibrillation, as we know this function. Uh, a lot of stents, two-stent technique for the left main. Um, I think we have also to think a little bit further than just the procedure and also the future. Uh, towards the uh, cutting balloon versus this uh, balloon, I must say I was surprised by the profile of the balloon. It passes very, very well. And this is not always the case with the cutting balloon. So, um, yeah, I so cutting we're... balloon would be harder to probably get down the this. And your big point, and I think it's a great point, is the uh, if there's so many stents with such complex disease, what's going to be our um, post-PCI anticoagulation, antiplatelet regimen in this fra So um, that was obviously quite an interesting discussion point for the audience, but they missed that the chap had had the EF treated with the PVI and actually wasn't on anticoagulation anymore because he had problems with bleeding. Uh, in the past, uh, so he was uh, just going to be on dual antiplatelet therapy after his, uh, his PCI, but it was also quite an interesting thing for them to, to discuss. So um, as you saw, we um, used the shockwave uh, through both limbs, and uh, then we go on to do uh, IVIS reassessment to see what we've done, and that's what the next, uh, the next clip's going to show you. Let's, uh, let's look at this IVIS run uh, as you're pulling back, but we can do both things. And there was a comment from Peter Smits. Uh, the audience is looking at the IVIS run to see if there's improvement. This is the LAD first, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. LAD that's right. first, looks nice. Uh, Peter, did first. you want to say something? Yeah, so what I wanted to say is that if you go for a professional stenting of the circle flex, uh, then you also have to do, um, keep in mind that um, after the stenting in the left main LAD, 
and you want to do a professional standing of the circumflex, um, it's rather hard to do the shockwave um, uh, at that moment because yeah. the shockwave itself might disrupt the, 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 the polymer of the, of the, the stand that you put in in the LF main and the LED. So in, in, if, you have your, if you have your professional stand uh, idea uh, strategy in mind, then, then um, you might run in trouble uh, yeah. taking the circumflex. No, that's a really good point. So Margaret, we've got 10 minutes for you or 12 minutes for you to finish this yeah. case. So we don't wanna, we're gonna okay. stop talking and okay. we're gonna let you guys do the talking, but I can tell okay. you we'll this it, Ibis we'll looks incredibly we... better. I'm very impressed. I mean, take a look at that. Did you see the fractures? Been... Yeah, we'll show, we'll show you the fractures are pretty dramatic um, in that mid segment. So we'll see, we're coming towards the proximal osteo lesion in that LED. So we'll see what we've done to that. So still that bit of protruding tissue here, but we weren't expecting to you see it's a bit more broken up. Oh, definitely. Than it was at the beginning. A nice fracture there. Yeah, and there as well. Nice fracture there. This is okay, really so impressive. I mean, you made a believer out of me team. after this. Yeah. Peter, are you more convinced? Yeah. I'm a little so convinced this really quite looks quite good. Well, we, we just started using shockwave in our center and I was pretty much amazed by the fact how much you can do with your shockwave alone. Yeah. And, it, and if you do and OCD, I saw there was no hemodynamic compromise, yeah. by the way, and that's that's impressive. Marco, no. don't be so quiet. You have some comments? Gosh. Marco Valjamigli. Well, and, I think it's a very nice demonstration about shockwave, actually, because normally, what predicts the response to that therapy is a ring of cast of 360 degrees, which was missing here. And despite this, the therapy was actually producing fractures, which were very clear. And also taking into account that you cannot have LV support well, uh, in this case, I think shockwave is a perfect yeah. choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. Can we be sure it was the shockwave, uh, uh, given that the balloons yeah. expanded pretty, uh, clear, pretty evenly across it? Uh, Bonnie, sorry, I didn't hear. Yeah. So I want to be sure that it was sort of the shockwave that caused those fractures because the balloons actually expanded pretty well, even at low pressures in those areas. So yeah, so you don't know how much alone. of it is balloon, how much the count though itself by ibis i mean i'm a little yeah, bit that, impressed by that you were making a blue see that with four atmospheres right it was only four atmospheres right, so and i think this, that uh, uh, when you inflate balloons and heavily calcified nodules you're typically stretching the more normal <laughs> part of the vessel right it's, it's true it's balloon, balloon, it? yes. 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 Balloon so it's not only at four atmospheres so you wouldn't expect that fraction all right so, so here's the circumflex that's looking pretty good too but so yeah the, the, so the good news is that you haven't dissected. Else. There's not been a big dissection here, which yeah. also is interesting. So can, can we use the shock with clear yeah. the vessel? There is a dissection here, and the dissection is at the soft tissue. Oh, well, there's a so little dissection there. Yeah, I just there saw it. There was another dissection on the LED also in the soft yeah. tissue. There you and I am less optimistic about the shockwave results. I don't see a big luminal gain, and that's what you want to get, particularly at the optimum of the LED. Uh, I see some plug modification, but I'm not sure, sure the lesion is well prepared now to do stenting because basically you are now just relying on stenting yes. for uh, achieving a good result. Presumably now we might be going no. back with a so, non so the, the balloon. The strongest, yeah. uh, so the strongest predictor of outcome of stent expansion is, is a calcium fracture, not luminal gain. So as long as we're convinced we've adequately fractured the calcium, we're quite confident we'll get a good stent outcome. But Specifically in the osteum of LED, we're going to take a big non-compliant balloon before we, we charge on instead to make sure that we're happy that that's going to expand. So, any thoughts on the IVIS and what you would do now? Well, well um, I'm, I'm completely um, also convinced that the uh, little Tripsy has done a pretty good job. However, uh, whether the stent will expand um, sufficiently, that is the question, uh, again, as uh, mentioned by Hector. Um, I, I think um, what I do in this situation is I, I, I will um, post-dilate after IVL um, with an um, one-to-one -one ratio balloon just to be convinced that there is a good expansion and um, just to be prepared better um, before I implant my stand. That's exactly what I do as well, Volker. Um, I'll also do that. I think, why not? Just make sure um, that you're not going to end up with, the, if you've overestimated uh, what you've done. What about you, Carlo? 
Well, IBUS definitely has the advantage not to require contrast media, somewhat easier to deliver. However, uh, you can't see as well as with OCT the fractures. So while uh, for the first assessment uh, before treatment uh, and the last assessment uh, after stent uh, post dilatation, I think uh, they are somewhat somehow equally good. Uh, better in this case IBUS because uh, you do see also the osteomodel of main uh, something that of course OCT will miss. Uh, immediately after uh, having done a little tripsy, the OCT is more uh, obvious and may help because here, for instance, you have some recoil, the osteomodel AD. Is that recoil going to give up once you have uh, you inflated the stents? Likely yes, because we saw a balloon inflated in the worst view. Uh, you didn't do two views, but it was the worst view, the right uh, RAO for the LAD, the one that had the most severe narrowing to start with. Uh, however, th there is a, a margin of uncertainty uh, um, due to the type of intravascular technique you have been using. Okay, so um, I did just what Holger suggested, and I'll show you the last clip. Uh, I think we've all been uh, challenged with multiple cutting balloons and MC balloons and high pressure balloons uh, without really modifying uh, the calcium. So, so the shock wave is actually giving us something new. Yeah. And in 20 minutes, we've modified a long segment of calcific disease and the left main LED and circumflex, which normally would take us a lot longer with other techniques and in a high risk case like this, I think that's really important. Yeah. Yeah, and I have so, uh, uh, so Margaret, so uh, just tell us yeah. the plan because we only have seven minutes and we want to see your culotte or yeah. whatever the bifurcation so, technique is that you're yeah. planning to do. Okay. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take a, a 4 or 5 NC to the ostium of the LED back into left main to convince ourselves that we're happy we're going to be able to push that slightly nodular calcium out of the way. And then we're going to step the mid LED um, and the kind of prox mid LED, then the prox mid circ, and then we're going to do a collot with this new left main dedicated Megatron uh, stent, which comes and three, five to five O, oh, and all the stents will expand to six. So we it got CE mark this week, and we've done some cases with it in Glasgow this week, and we've certainly liked the way it's handled in this type of anatomy. And um, so that's what our plan is. So we'll do as much as that as we can in the time we've got less. Dr. Really, Gaspar, any any comments? So you? Not no. I'm really glad that you're actually thinking of cooling here because this is one of the. A few areas where I think it's really important to get a good anatomical result, yeah. both in both osteo and in the left main. And I think yeah. you can only do that through cool out if you do it correctly. That's good. So is that a three five balloon, three five non compliant balloon there? So, it looks so that's nicely five, dilated. That's a four five non compliant four, balloon. Five. So you can see that that's come up very nicely. So hopefully, you know, with the fractures we're able to get with the IBL, we're now convinced ourselves with a high pressure, non compliant balloon that we're going to get an expansion of the stem. So you're okay. choosing... So there was a lot of chat, as you can imagine from the panel, it was a 45 minute shot. So we ran out of transmission time, but I'll finish the case by showing you the stenting. So we stented that lesion in the proximal LED. We then stented to the mid circ and the proximal circ. And then we did a clot, so um, stent back from the circuit into the left main pot, rewired the LED, opened the struts, completed the clot with the second stent, rewired again, kissing balloons, and then you see on the right the final uh, mangiographic result. So um, we were really pleased with that. We thought that the IVL had done a fantastic job. And I'll show you a final um, IVIS run, which this is LED back into left main. And it's really we've focused on the very proximal segment just for um, time efficiency. And uh, you'll see there's a collot. It's a really lovely figure of eight collot. And that I'm sure you noticed just in the Austin with LED, just a little bit of eccentricity, but actually all things considered, we felt that um, it had come up really well uh, considering how nodular that calcium was in the Austin with LED. <laughs> So this case um, was probably the first case that I did where I was really um, persuaded that there's a role for shortwave and IVL out with the concentric calcific uh, situation. Um, 
I really was impressed with how it behaved in that situation. Um, I wonder if uh, Holger or Carl have got any further thoughts about that and what you think about how it performed in that case? Well, well uh, first of all, congratulations to this very well um, performed uh, um, PCI. It's a brilliant result. And um, I, of course, um, this um, I would not have expected um, without um, any pre preparation um, with the IVL. So IVL did a perfect job in this case. And uh, obviously, um, it managed also um, to tackle this kind of eccentric lesions. Um, so um, obviously, um, rotational atherectomy uh, would not have been um, um, result in the same or similar situation. So um, for that um, kind of lesion was a perfect result. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Carol, so you me, Margaret is, is an excellent result. And uh, I think, uh, in, you know, uh, well, when you prepare the lesion well, uh, you, you can uh, obtain in general a good result uh, if you stick uh, to, to the correct strategy, including uh, uh, the, the double pot that you did. Uh, I mean, you did everything right, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'll close off the case and I'll hand over to Holger, who's going to present us um, some of his data based on uh, the CAD 2, looking at concentric and eccentric calcium. Thanks, Holger.